Mavis. All right, the Brian Billick Report is brought to you by Mavis Discount Tires. Save on tires at MavisTire.com. Joseph Boot Flagship Store. Experience exceptional quality, style, and service at its very best. Uh, Brian Billick's on the NFL Network's Playbook Wednesday nights at 6 p.m. with uh, ex-giant Sean O'Hara, and he joins us now. Brian, welcome. How are you? Good afternoon. If you don't want to answer this, just say we'll move on. Uh, so I'm not trying to sandbag you. If you were still coaching, how would you handle this with your team as far as the national anthem? Boy, this is a tough one because as a coach, regardless of whatever your personal perspective may be, you, you've got to look at this two ways. One, you have to respect the rights of the players to use their celebrity, their platform uh, in any way that they choose to. But by the same token, the players have to respect what you want as an organization, how you want to deal with this. Anytime you let religion or politics into the locker room, it can be very divisive. Uh, and as a coach, strictly from a business standpoint, it's my job to make sure that we minimize the distraction. So whatever you do, there's no right answer to this. But clearly what you've got to do, you've got to do it in a unified manner. And the players have to recognize that, yes, we will respect your right to make these kinds of statements. But however we're going to do it, you've got to respect that we as an organization are going to do it collectively. And, and balancing that respect for each other's perspective, that's a tough one. Do you want to say in that as the coach, Brian, or do you want to leave that up to the owner? You want to consult? You're probably going to consult the owner on that one. But, I mean, do you, going to do, do you and the owner have to get on the same page with this? Oh, absolutely. You know, if, if the owner decides to go out and draw a red line one way or the other, you then have you, you as the coach, just like anything, on a day-to-day basis, you're the one that's going to have to deal with it. So it does have to be an organizational decision. By that, I mean not only ownership uh, and the head coach, but the players as well. And they have to be on board and understanding that balance between where you're going to try. You know, you saw it in Dallas, whether that was the right way or the wrong way to, to lock arms, to say we're in this together. We'll na- take a knee to register that we respect what it is the players are saying, but then we're going to stand for the anthem. Uh, no matter what you do, there's going to be criticisms. Uh, and, and however it's done, it has to be from a collective perspective with input from the players. You have to respect that, but the players have to respect that at the end of the day, whatever the ownership and the coach say, this is how we're going to deal with it, that's what you got to do. Now to the other one, which is Beckham. Um, the coach backed off saying anything about Beckham's antics. The Giants took a lot of heat from people like me, and then uh, the owner came out with, I am very unhappy with it, and I'll take care of it internally. Now states he has handled it internally. Beckham said he met with the owner. Does that, in your mind, put the uh, young head coach in a tough spot? Yeah, it does, because we've, we've, we've been down this road before, haven't we, in terms of the end of the last year and the playoffs and or whenever it was where they decided to go down. I, I still, yes, that is the right way to handle it, and the, the Giants are a class organization. Again, this is a tough one to deal with, but not really, because in, in whose mind did what he do is that acceptable? Right. I can't imagine that's even acceptable for Dell Beckham. I mean, the concern I would have is what what were you thinking? Because obviously that's not something spur of the moment that you just decided to do that. Yep. That had some forethought in it. And what that, that would be the conversation for my money that you'd have to have. How is it you thought that would be acceptable? And that, then, and then his right. comment after the game, I don't care if we kick off from the five. How can that be your comment after the game? This is a team game. How can you not care if your team kicks off from the five? That, that shows a lack, a total lack of understanding and maturity by a very gifted player that still doesn't seem to understand that he is a part of this team and whatever he does can't be detrimental to the team. You can't keep asking your team, to forgive because of your incredible talent and, and sounds by all you know uh, accounts a good teammate to just forgive these stupid immature antics. All right, now the other one is this is the idea of one surprising result. Jaguars are rolling along. Uh, Ravens are rolling along. They go to London and get beat forty-four to you know four hundred to nothing. Uh, how, as a coach, do you minimize? Now, Harbaugh is a good coach, good staff, veteran guy. The idea of minimizing or utilizing that as a way to get to your team when you get demolished out of nowhere in a game. 
Yeah, that's and and they're not the lone ranger in that. There were a lot of games that and and right now what we're finding. Yeah, Dolphins. Was, look at that, the Dolphins got their lunch from the Jets. I mean, the Jets beat them every which way but upside down. They killed them. And the Chicago Bears ran for how many yards yep. on the Pittsburgh Steelers? Yep. What it's telling us is that there is no team that's not vulnerable to that kind of loss. That there is no team that dominant, which makes it kind of an exciting. You know, there are a lot of teams out there now that can lay claim to hey, we we can make this thing happen. Because there doesn't appear to be that dominant team. Because everybody seems vulnerable to a degree. I guess Kansas City so far is right. the only one. And Atlanta's Atlanta good, too. Something. Atlanta's good, too. Yeah, Yeah, but then that really should have been a loss. It could have been. And listen, they could have been. They could have lost both their road games easily. Right. They, so, were on a, they were so on a five-yard line, and they were on a goal line. So they, they played two tight road games. Yeah, so it tells you that it's, it's an open field. And a game like, to answer your question directly, it's one of two things. If you just physically, man for man across the board, got your butt whipped, I don't know that there's a lot of value in showing your team that. You know, because, okay, what's the teaching principle in me showing you that the guy across from you kicked your butt? Now, if it was, there are going to be some technical things. Look, guys, we made this mistake, this misalignment, this breakdown in coverage, stepped with the wrong foot here, punched with the wrong arm there. Okay, that, that's all well and good. But this is one that you just got to kind of move on from. Uh, okay, do you get a mulligan? Well, we'll find out because they're about to play two teams uh, in Pittsburgh and then two weeks from now having to go to the West Coast and play Oakland that uh, we're going to find out, indeed, was this a misstep? Was it a one-off? Or is this more endemic to a team that's having some difficulties? We're talking with Brian Billick as we do each and every week. Thursday night, Bears coming off a big win in the Green Bay, take on the Packers. Now, you talk about the psychology of results, which coaches deal with all the time. Played miserably, but won the game because in the fourth quarter, you said, hey, quarterback, go out there, win me the game. I don't care how you do it. Win me the game. C- calling, make, Making up the plays by his own admission in the huddle for the fourth, in the fourth quarter. Running stuff that they hadn't even practiced because they were getting sacked so badly. Just trying to improvise and spread things out. Win the game because of the brilliance of your quarterback, but I mean your offensive line disintegrated, your defense at times is disintegrated, and now you got to get ready in two days to play the Bears. Yeah, and and but they they are are very comfortable with that. They play the Bears on a regular basis and very well, particularly in Green Bay. Uh, and yeah, I mean this is this is classic Aaron Rodgers, is it not? Uh, I think from a coaching standpoint, it. It, it definitely begs itself to go, okay, well, we're going to try to help you a little bit more this week because <laughs> we're not going to ask you to to now come down with a minute 17 to go 70 yards uh, to kick a field goal uh, in under a minute 17. Although I do have to tell you, and I've been telling the story, you know, I'm watching all the games on the weekend yep. and I got the city ticket, so I'm bouncing around because uh, I got to be ready to on Mondays to grind through the film for my show for Playbook on Wednesdays on the NFL Network. And I'm sitting there, my wife of 40-some-odd years, she's been around this a little bit. She's coming and going, kind of rolling through. And she walks through, and she sees Brett Favre, 70 yards to go, uh, a minute 17. And as she passes through, she just goes, well, Cincinnati's dead. They're, they're, they've lost. And then just kept going. Yeah, she's she right. She to see, to see what was going to happen because she thought, no, Aaron Rodgers, minute 17, no, nope, that ain't going to happen. Uh, they're going to win. and But it's classic Aaron Rodgers. Well, same and, thing uh, with Tom to... Brady in New England. You knew once they got the ball back and it was not it less more than a touchdown, you knew he was going to put the ball in the end zone. And don't you know if you're Bill O'Brien and you're having to decide whether to go on that fourth and you one? you got to go. Which is probably... you got to go. You know, you can look at... You can't go up five against that guy. Good. The guy's got 350 yards passing in the game. you got to go. Yeah, so you, particularly having been with them, does not there a part of you go, oh, now I've seen this before. This may or may not be yes. the right decision, but that's Tom Brady. I ain't going to give the ball back uh, to him. You can't. You can't. I mean, those two guys especially show you they separate themselves right now. They just do. You know, the other guy that I've seen that in the last couple of years, except he's too beat up now, is Luck, who just, those guys separate themselves. Right now, Rodgers and Brady just better than everybody else. Yeah, and and those and again, uh, Andrew Luck, I think we'll get there. But right now, I mean, who who better than Brady and, and Rogers? Unbelievable. And you, have to, you have to have the those kind of conversations, particularly when you're on the road. You know, it's kind of like going for the two point. I always used to talk to my staff about, okay, guys, notwithstanding we don't know how the game's going, but if it comes down to the end, 
do we go for the two point play or not? And and many times it would be well, you know, your perspective would be different on the road versus at a home. I may be more conservative. I'm going to let it go our way. We wear the team down. But on the road, particularly a place like Foxborough, I'm not sure that those conversations aren't. Look, if we have a 50 50 chance of winning this game by going for two points in Foxborough against Tom Brady. Don't you have to take it? Well, this is kind of the same thing. Bottom line is we talked about this last week about 0-2 teams and the desperation. We saw a lot of 0-2 teams come up big last week. We saw Bengals did, but they lost. Okay, it happens. They lost to a great player. But you saw the Jets. You saw the Bears. You saw the Saints. You saw a lot of teams that were, you know, Terrible the first couple of weeks, jump up and play well. Even the Giants, you know, they didn't win the game. They came back with a fury in the fourth quarter. They were desperate. Uh, Their defense amazingly let down. Uh, But they, you know, you saw a lot of teams with a lot of life that were 0-2 last week. Yeah, and that's exactly what you come, you know, when you lose in the opening week, it's, oh, my God, my world's over. But you realize we can even it up next week. And like half the league, we're going to be 1-1. and And then when you're in part of the two and one combination now and you've got that energy, you have to also realize we can you can step on it this week and all of a sudden now be two and two. So, you know, it's 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 like we always say, if a team is, is six and three, if they're seven and three, how do you feel about yourself? Well, when did I win the seven and when did I lose the three? You know, Brian, the Giants, are, uh, they easily could have won last week. We get beat on a 61-yard field goal. We know they had plenty of opportunities to win the game. They scored 24 points in the fourth quarter. Then now 0-3, they go to Tampa. This is a team that almost everybody in the Western Hemisphere put in the playoffs this year. All right? They're now 0-3. Their schedule is brutal. They have, they, they, you know, outside of division, they have some they go to the Raiders. They got Kansas City. They got Denver on the road. They got they got a rough schedule, and the division has come up tough. Washington, Philly, Dallas. So they have brutal games all season, and their schedule is murder. And they're staring at zero and four. Let's be honest; these guys in this room, they know they can't go zero and four against the schedule. They can't. So how you know? How do you get that across where it's no longer hype, it's no longer nonsense, they need a win, and they need it now? Yeah, well, you don't, you don't want to wear yourself out emotionally during the week thinking about that because, it's yeah, it's the elephant in the room. Everybody knows that. And to have to go on the road to a pretty good Tampa Bay team, particularly defensively, uh, you got to hope that, you know, Jameis Winston throws you a bunch of balls and whatever. They're capable of turning the ball over. But you're absolutely right. It's, it's, everybody knows what 0-4 means. Now, if you get there, it's, hey, we're just going to take it one at a time, and, and you know, we're, you know, we're just going to win one at a time and look up and where we're at. But, and I understand that. We're a league of uh, all it is is about this week. But what you're talking about is very real. It would be naive to think that it's not in the back of the players. You don't want them to emotionally wear out with that whole concept of carrying that and wearing yourself out during the game uh, particularly when you're having to go on the road. And it's it's got to be a conscious thought of holding that at arm's length and not letting yourself succumb to it. How about the 3-0 and team now? And there's only a couple of them. Atlanta, Kansas City stand out prominently. Atlanta's 3-0. and They buried the Packers at home in impressive fashion in their one win and one home game. They went on the road. And they survived. They survived the Bears being on the five-yard line. They survived the Lions scoring and having it reversed. And instead, they're going home to play the Buffalo Bills. They're 3-0. and And you know how good they are at home. And now they are 3-0. and And they are sitting on top of this thing. And they know how talented they are. Uh, they did dodge some bullets. But that's probably now a very nice position to be sitting in. Not just because you're 3-0, and but that you did dodge those bullets early in the season. Uh, it gives you a lot to get it, dig into your defense about. And you are 3-0. and Yeah, and, and I will tell you that as a coach, for Dan Quinn, he's got to take the same approach that Coach McAdoo does with New York, all but from a different emotional state. Because the flip side of that is, at 3-0, and guys, let's slow down here a little bit. Let's not get caught up with all the emotion of everybody. Okay, let's not quite make our arrangement for Minnesota in the Super Bowl because, you know, whether you're 3-0 and or 0-3, and either can pull your focus away from the task at hand. So yeah, it's all you got to do is look at the film in Buffalo and how well they played last week and got an unexpected win. This is a capable team. We've got to know where we where we're vulnerable because yes, we could be sitting here at one and three. And you're not trying to 
you know, suck the energy out of your team or the passion out of your team by saying, hey, you guys are really aren't three and oh, you're one and you're one and two. Uh, but you make sure they understand. You guys know you're looking at the film. We easily left ourselves vulnerable, and we got to do those things to not let ourselves be that vulnerable at the end of the game, to let a Matthew Stafford and, and in this instance, kind of unique officiating call be the thing that save us. We don't want to put ourselves in that position, and here's how we go about doing that. Is that the rare time a, a team grows from defeat? Do the Lions take a positive from that comeback against the Falcons, even though they lost and they got a rough game in Minnesota this week? But, I mean, is that something that team can use to rally around, that they did make that comeback last week? Yeah, like they said, there are no moral victories, but they do have to feel good about what they did against a very good team, all but doing it at home in Detroit. They looked at facing a Minnesota team that looks very, very good right now. Much better on offense when they've been you yep. know, so great on defense. And now they've got a running game uh, with, with the young running Cook back. Cook is wonderful. Florida. Yeah, he's and, wonderful. Wonderful. And, and uh, Sheldon Diggs and, and Thielen look to be the real deal. Uh, and they're making big plays down the field. So Minnesota's very real. Detroit can feel good about what they did and where they're at. But it doesn't take long to all of a sudden these moral victories add up to the point where we're not very good. There's some very interesting games this week. You have uh, the Lions and the Vikings, big game in that division, no question. You have the Raiders and the Broncos in Denver, both coming off defeats. Raiders got whipped, whipped on by the Redskins. And then the Redskins uh, hit the road, hit, go to Kansas City. Uh, flying high off a win against uh, the Raiders where they were very impressive, and then they get the undefeated Chiefs on Monday night. A lot of interesting games this week. Yeah, if you talk about all the teams that are on that that cusp that we're talking about, how good can you be and where are you at, and everybody's there. The 2-1 and one Washington Redskins are the most intriguing to me. They can go, and they're capable. They're playing much better defense with Greg Minuski as the defensive coordinator. Um, the fact that they have you know, it was a, a tough early loss, obviously, to the Eagles, but and the Rams seemed to be better. Beating up on the Raiders, and the way they did it was impressive. Now, I know it's the Raiders, West Coast going East Coast and all that. Well, we're going to find out against a very explosive, what could be an explosive Kansas City team. This offense against that defense and the way they generate turnovers, um, this is going to be a real challenge for Cousins. But I tell you what, the way they're playing, this could be a real sea change I think the Washington Redskins going in and beating the Chiefs could all of a sudden put themselves atop the NFC as that team to beat if they indeed can go into Kansas City and pull this off. And talk about uh, a rivalry you know very well, and we're talking with Brian Billick. The Steelers off a bad loss. I mean, they lost to a, a – that team's not a great team, that bad team. This All right, they, they did some nice things, but let's be honest. They're not a very good team. And the Steelers lose that game. Now they go take on the Ravens. We know what that rivalry is. We know how that game seems to always be 2017 somebody. And the Ravens coming off a game in London, well, let's be honest. I mean, they just got destroyed in London. Yeah, and that, and again, is this a one-off? You're right. It's going to be a close game. It always is. It, to me, it comes down to Ben Roethlisberger and how he plays. Uh, typically, he plays well at home against the Ravens and not so well on the road. Uh, and he turns the ball over, and he misses a lot of big plays. So that's going to be the challenge. Now, they also have to look up and say, now, wait a minute now. The Jacksonville Jaguars ran for 220 yards on that Raven defense. Now, I don't care if it was in London. I don't care what the matchups are. We've got Le'Veon Bell. We've got an offensive line. And typically, they've not run particularly well against the Ravens. They've got to challenge that. And Ben Roethlisberger has to have his uncharacteristic good game in Baltimore, he left a lot of big plays. The opening game of the uh, uh, the opening play of the game against uh, Chicago should have been a touchdown. They had a, a call up that was ideally suited for the defense they got, and he overthrew Martavius Bryant. They're not going to be able to do that in Baltimore. He's got to hit the big plays when they present themselves. Uh, well, you know, last week was a week where there was some odd games, and you had a lot of odd results. This week, you got a lot of big games. You got a lot of big rivalry games. You got a lot of games between teams that have, as you said, have big aspirations this this year. This is a very interesting weekend. I mean, the Sunday night game is a bad one because you got the Colts who aren't any good against the Seahawks who you know are trying to find themselves. But the Monday night with Washington and the Chiefs, and as you said, a lot of big games on Sunday, big neighborhood battles, you know, division battles, but games that have a lot of meaning this week. I mean, you know, Lions and Vikings, winners in good shape. Same thing with the uh, Broncos and Raiders. One of those teams is coming out 3-1 and and the other one's going on a two-game losing streak, so those are big games. 
Yeah, you know, it's, like I said, we're always a team. Everybody's about, well, we're just about this week. But you do, you look at the, the, the quarter marks, quarter mark, halfway mark, three-quarter mark. We'll come up to the quarter mark. Uh, this is where teams begin to show signs of separating themselves, whether they're a part of the pack, whether they're really, really bad, or whether, whether they're really, really good. And you're right. And the fact that it's, it's packed in there with a lot of emotion because it does seem to be rivalry weekend in the NFL as best you can. This is uh, it's going to be an interesting week for sure. You know what's changed a little bit too, Brian, is this, and I, this was culminated in the in the Giant game. We've seen the line in football now moved out. These guys can now make field goals to win games between 54 and 60 yards. They can make these field goals now. These guys can kick the ball that far. In the old days, they couldn't kick it that far. You know, maybe indoors they tried it. Maybe you had a Dempsey boot one with his special shoe. But let's be honest, you couldn't make it, for the most part, more than 53, 52, 53 to win a game. That was going to be distance. These guys now can kick it high 50s to 60 to win a game. Yeah, and you and you and and at the end of the game, that now truly becomes an option. So now, where before, and what do we do in any two minutes? We say, okay, here's the mark they have to go to 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 is in their range to make the field goal, and the play calling reflects that. Well, and that that margin gets pushed all the way out to the forty yard line, the forty five. I mean, that's that opens up a lot of your playbook in terms of where do I get to get a realistic field goal. I mean, it's re- these guys. They're le- I guess they're just getting stronger. I mean, they just they, you know these guys. They're kicking the ball farther now. They just are. Yeah, or everybody's pumping air. Into the yeah, ball. whatever, let's, something. I don't know. Let's, let's, I mean, to make us when he when he lined up for a sixty-one okay. yarder, I'm saying, okay, you know, I would try it too. When he kicked the sixty-one yarder through, I'm like, are you kidding me? He kicks a sixty-one yarder to win the game. Yeah, and typically those are the trajectories too low, and the, the things that have to happen. That was. Uh, that was pretty incredible, but now it adds a whole new element to it in terms of who's in and who's out of a game. And you're right. I, I, it, at the end of the day, it's that kind of kick that could make the difference between going to a Super Bowl tonight. All right. As we approach the quarter mark, it, who's the best team? Kansas City because they're winning New England. Atlanta because they're 3-0. and They're the only teams that are unblemished right now. Uh, uh, or somebody else grab you. Grab you. Who, who's the best team right now? Yeah, the e- the easy thing to do, obviously, is is to take the teams that are undefeated. Although we're a little early to 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 make you know that declaration. Does New England's defense practice. scare you? It does, and and so by uh, right now, Kansas City beyond the three and zero start has to be a team. I love the Tennessee Titans. Their ability to run the ball the way they did against Seattle, I think, was a statement. Uh, that's a team that, and it's hard not to pick Kansas City until they until they falter here or show. Their blemish, but Tennessee in the AFC. If I had to bet right now, that what they did to, to Seattle in that running game was was incredible. And in the NFC, like I said, you know Atlanta, you can't pick against. They seem to be on the edge. Aaron Rodgers, how do you not go with them? But I tell you what, you got to watch these Washington Redskins. To me, they could be that team that surprises everybody. Well, that's a big Monday night. That'll be interesting to watch. We'll talk to you next week. Thanks very much. That's great. All right, Brian Billick. T- buying tickets can be complicated and confusing, but there's a better way to do it with SeatGeek. SeatGeek is the smartest, easiest way to get tickets to every game all season long, whether you're planning a day out or just maybe buying some present for somebody. SeatGeek saves you time and money by searching multiple ticket sites to compare prices and find amazing deals. To get you the most bang for your buck, SeatGeek grades every ticket based on value to help you immediately identify the best seats that fit your budget. And if it doesn't end with sports, well, SeatGeek can also get you concerts or, you know, theater of tickets or whatever you're looking for. Best of all, new users get $20 off their first purchase. Just download the SeatGeek app, enter promo code BILLICK, B-I-L-L-I-C-K today. That's promo code B-I-L-L-I-C-K, BILLICK, for $20 off your first SeatGeek purchase. See it live with SeatGeek. Right seat, right